Book six, chapter twelve of History of the Reformation in the Sixteenth Century, Volume two, by Jean Henri Mel d'Aubigne, translated by Henry Beveridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twelve. If the legates of Rome failed with the mighty of the world, the inferior agents of the papacy succeeded in producing disturbance among the weak the militia of rome had heard the command of their chief fanatical priests employed the bull in alarming consciences and honest but ill-informed ecclesiastics regarded it as a sacred duty to act conformably to the instructions of the pope luther had begun his struggle against rome in the confessional and in the confessional rome gave battle to the adherents of the reformer the bull though openly condemned by the nation became powerful in these solitary tribunals have you read the writings of luther demanded the confessors do you possess them do you regard them as sound or as heretical if the penitent hesitated to pronounce the anathema the priest refused him absolution several consciences were troubled the people were strongly agitated this skilful manoeuvre promised to restore to the papal yoke whole districts already gained to the gospel rome congratulated herself on having in the thirteenth century erected a tribunal destined to bring the free consciences of christians under subjection to the priests while it continues in force her reign is not ended luther became aware of these circumstances single-handed what will he do to defeat the manoeuvre the word the word uttered loudly and boldly such is his weapon the word will search out these alarmed consciences these frightened souls and strengthen them a powerful impulse was required and luther's voice was heard addressing penitents with heroic boldness and a noble disregard of all secondary considerations when you are asked says he whether or not you approve my books answer you are a confessor not an inquisitor or a jailer my duty is to confess what my conscience dictates yours not to probe and discover the secrets of my heart give me absolution and thereafter dispute with luther the pope and whomsoever you please but do not connect the sacrament of peace with strife and combat if the confessor will not yield then continues luther i would rather dispense with his absolution give yourself no uneasiness if man will not absolve you god will absolve you rejoice in that you are absolved by god himself and present yourself without fear at the sacrament of the altar the priest will have to account at the final judgment for the absolution which he shall have refused you they may indeed refuse us the sacrament but they cannot deprive us of the strength and grace which god has attached to it god has placed salvation neither in their will nor in their power but in our faith leave their sacrament altar priest church the word of god condemned in the bull is more than all these things the soul can dispense with the sacrament but cannot live without the word christ the true bishop will himself undertake to nourish you spiritually thus luther's voice found its way into families and alarmed consciences imparting to them courage and faith but it was not enough for him merely to defend himself he felt it his duty to attack and return blow for blow ambrose catherine a roman theologian had written against him i will stir up the bile of the italian beast said luther and he kept his word in his reply he proved by the revelations of daniel and st john by the epistles of st paul st peter and st jude that the reign of antichrist predicted and described in the bible was the papacy i know for certain says he in conclusion that our lord jesus christ lives and reigns strong in this assurance i would not fear several thousands of popes may god at length visit you according to his infinite power and cause the day of the glorious advent of his son to shine 
that day in which he will destroy the wicked and let all the people say amen and all the people did say amen a holy fear took possession of men's souls they saw antichrist seated on the pontifical throne this new idea an idea which derived great force from the prophetical description being thrown by luther into the midst of his age gave rome a dreadful shock faith in the divine word was substituted for that which until then the church alone had obtained and the power of the pope which had long been adored by the people became the object of their hatred and terror germany replied to the papal bull by surrounding luther with acclamation the plague was in wittemberg and yet arrivals of new students daily took place while from four to six hundred pupils regularly took their seats in the academic halls at the feet of luther and melanchthon the church of the convent and the town church were too small for the crowds eager to hear the words of the reformer the prior of the augustines was in terror lest these churches should give way under the pressure of the audience but the movement was not confined within the walls of wittemberg it extended over germany letters full of consolation and faith from princes noble and learned men reached luther from all quarters he showed the chaplain more than thirty of them one day the margrave of brandenburg with several other princes arrived at wittemberg to visit luther they wished to see the man said the margrave in fact all wished to see the man whose word alarmed the pope and caused the pontiff of the west to totter on his throne the enthusiasm of luther's friends increased from day to day unparalleled folly of emsa exclaimed melanchthon to presume to measure weapons with our hercules overlooking the finger of god in the actions of luther as the king of egypt overlooked it in the hand of moses the mild melanchthon found strong expressions to excite those who seemed to him to retrograde or remain stationary luther has stood up for the truth wrote he to john hess and yet you keep silence he still breathes he still prospers though leo is indignant and roars with rage remember it is impossible for roman impiety to approve of the gospel how should this unhappy age be without its judases caiaphases pilots and herods arm yourself then with the power of the word of god against such adversaries all the writings of luther his lord's prayer and especially a new edition of the german theology were eagerly devoured reading societies were formed for the purpose of procuring his works for the use of the members friends made new impressions of them and circulated them by means of hawkers they were also recommended from pulpits a german church was demanded one in which no dignity should in future be conferred on any one who was not able to preach to the people in german and the german bishops of which should everywhere oppose the papal power moreover cutting satires directed against the leading ultramontanists were circulated throughout the provinces of the empire the opposition united all its forces around this new doctrine which gave it precisely what it wanted by justifying it in regard to religion the greater part of the lawyers weary of the quirks of the ecclesiastical tribunals attached themselves to the reformation but its cause was keenly embraced above all by the humanists ulrich von hutten was indefatigable he wrote letters to luther to the legates and the leading men of germany i tell you and tell you again o marinus said he to the legate caraccioli in one of his publications the mists with which you blinded us are cleared away the gospel is preached the truth proclaimed the absurdities of rome treated with contempt your ordinances languish and die liberty begins not contenting himself with prose hutton had recourse to verse also he published his cry on the burning by luther appealing to jesus christ he prayed him to consume with the brightness of his countenance those who dared to deny his power he began moreover to write in german 
hitherto said he i have written in latin a language which all could not comprehend but now i address myself to my country his german rhymes laid open and enabled the people to read the shameful and voluminous record of the sins of the roman court but hutton was unwilling to confine himself to mere words he was impatient to bring his sword into the struggle for he thought that by the swords and halberds of the many valiant warriors of which germany was proud the vengeance of god was to be accomplished luther opposed his infatuated projects i would not said he that men should fight for the gospel by violence and carnage i have written so to hutton the celebrated painter lucas cranach published under the title of the passions of christ and antichrist engravings which represented on the one hand the splendour and magnificence of the pope and on the other the humility and sufferings of the redeemer luther wrote the inscriptions these engravings executed with great spirit produced an astonishing effect the people withdrew from a church which appeared so opposed to the spirit of its founder this work said luther is excellent for the laity several in opposing the papacy had recourse to arms which ill accorded with the holiness of the christian life emser in replying to luther's tract entitled to the goat emser had published one entitled to the bull of wittemberg the name was not ill chosen but at magdeburg emser's book was hung on the gallows with this inscription the book is worthy of the place and a rod was placed beside it to indicate the punishment which the author deserved at doblin there was written under the papal bull in derision of its impotent thunders the nest is here but the birds are flown at wittemberg the students taking advantage of the carnival clothed one of their number in a dress resembling that of the pope and paraded him through the streets pompously but rather too ludicrously says luther on arriving at the public square they went down to the banks of the river and some of them feigning a sudden attack seemed to wish to throw the pope into the water but the pope having no liking for such a bath took to his heels his cardinals bishops and familiars followed his example dispersing over all the quarters of the town while the students continued to pursue them there was not a corner of wittemberg where some roman dignitary did not flee before the shouts and laughter of the inhabitants who were all in motion the enemy of christ says luther who sports both with kings and with christ himself well deserves to be thus sported with in this we think him in error truth is too beautiful and ought never to be made to walk through the mire she ought to fight without such auxiliaries as songs caricatures and carnival frolics it may be that without these popular demonstrations her success would be less apparent but it would be more pure and consequently more durable be this as it may the imprudent and passionate conduct of the court of rome had excited universal antipathy and the bull by which the papacy thought to stifle everything was itself the cause of general revolt still the reformer's whole course was not one of exultation and triumph behind the car in which he was drawn by his zealous countrymen transported with admiration there was not wanting the slave appointed to remind him of his frailty some of his friends seemed to disposed to call a halt staupitz whom he called his father seemed shaken the pope had accused him and staupitz had declared his readiness to submit to the judgment of his holiness i fear said luther to him that in accepting the pope for judge you will seem to throw off me and the doctrines which i have maintained if christ loves you he will constrain you to retract your letter christ is condemned spoiled blasphemed it is time not to fear but to cry aloud wherefore while you exhort me to humility i exhort you to pride for you have too much humility just as i have too much of its opposite i shall be called proud and avaricious an adulterer a murderer an anti-pope a man guilty of all crimes 
it matters not so long as they cannot accuse me of having kept an impious silence at the moment when the lord was grieved and said i looked on my right hand and beheld but there was no man that would know me psalm 142 verse 4 the word of jesus christ is not a word of peace but a sword if you will not follow jesus christ i will walk alone advance alone and gain the day thus luther like the commander of an army kept an eye on the whole field of battle and while he urged fresh troops forward into the thickest of the fight marked those who appeared faint-hearted and recalled them to their post his exhortations were everywhere heard his letters rapidly succeeded each other three presses were constantly employed in multiplying his writings his words had free course among the people strengthened consciences which the confessionals had alarmed raised up those ready to faint in the convents and maintained the rights of truth in the palaces of princes amid the tempests which assail me wrote he to the elector i always hoped i would one day find peace but i now see it was only a man's thought day after day the wave is rising and i already stand in the midst of the ocean the tempest breaks loose with fearful roar with one hand i grasp the sword and with the other build up the walls of zion her ancient links are snapped asunder broken by the hand which darted the thunders of excommunication against her excommunicated by the bull says he i am loosed from the authority of the pope and monastic laws with joy i embrace the deliverance but i lay aside neither the habit of the order nor the convent and yet amidst all this agitation he never loses sight of the dangers by which his own soul is beset during the strife he feels the necessity of keeping a watch upon himself you do well to pray for me wrote he to pelican who was living at baal i cannot devote enough time to holy exercises my life is a cross you do well to exhort me to modesty i feel the want of it but i am not my own master i know not what spirit rules me i wish ill to nobody but my enemies press me with such fury that i am not sufficiently on my guard against the seductions of satan pray then for me thus both the reformer and the reformation hastened on in the direction in which god called them the movement extended men who might have been expected to be most faithful to the hierarchy began to be shaken even those says eck ingenuously enough who hold of the pope the best benefices and the rich canonries remain mute as fishes several among them even extol luther as a man filled with the spirit of god and call the defenders of the pope sophists and flatterers the church apparently great in power supported by the treasures the powers and the armies of the world but in reality emaciated and enfeebled without love to god without christian life without enthusiasm for the truth found herself in the presence of men simple but bold men who knowing that god is with those who combat for his word had no doubt of victory every age has experienced how powerful an idea is in penetrating the masses in arousing nations and if need be hurrying thousands to the field of battle and to death but if such is the influence of a human idea what must be the power of an idea sent down from heaven when god opens the door of the human heart the world has not often seen such a power in operation it did see it however in the first days of christianity and in those of the reformation and it will see it in days yet to come men who disdained the world's wealth and grandeur and were contented to lead a life of pain and poverty began to move in behalf of the holiest things upon the earth the doctrine of faith and of grace in this heaving of society all the religious elements were brought into operation and the fire of enthusiasm hurried men boldly forward into a new life an epoch of renovation which had just opened so majestically 
and towards which providence was hastening the nations. End of chapter 12 and end of book 6「Book Seven, Chapter One of History of the Reformation in the Sixteenth Century, Volume Two, by Jean Henri Mel d'Aubigne, translated by Henry Beveridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Christopher Smith. Book Seven, The Diet of Worms, fifteen twenty one, January to May. Chapter One. The Reformation, which commenced with the struggles of a humble soul in the cell of a convent at Erfurt, had never ceased to advance. An obscure individual, with the word of life in his hand, had stood erect in the presence of worldly grandeur, and made it tremble. This word he had opposed first to Tetzel and his numerous host, and these avaricious merchants, after a momentary resistance, had taken flight. Next, he had opposed it to the legate of Rome at Augsburg, and the legate, paralyzed, had allowed his prey to escape. At a later period, he had opposed it to the champions of learning in the halls of Leipzig, and the astonished theologians had seen their syllogistic weapons broken to pieces in their hands. At last he had opposed it to the Pope, who, disturbed in his sleep, had risen up upon his throne and thundered at the troublesome monk, but the whole power of the head of Christendom this word had paralyzed. The word had still a last struggle to maintain. It behoved to triumph over the emperor of the West, over the kings and princes of the earth, and then, victorious over all the powers of the world, take its place in the church to reign in it as the pure word of God. The whole kingdom was agitated. Princes and nobles, knights and citizens, clergy and laity, town and country, all were engrossed a mighty religious revolution of which god himself was the prime mover but which was also deeply rooted in the minds of the people was threatening to overthrow the long venerated head of the roman hierarchy a new generation of a grave profound active and energetic spirit filled the universities towns courts and castles the rural districts and not unfrequently cloisters also the feeling that a great social transformation was at hand animated all minds with holy enthusiasm. In what relation will the new emperor stand to this movement of the age, and what will be the issue of the mighty impulse by which all feel that they are borne along? A solemn diet was about to be opened. It was the first imperial assembly over which the youthful Charles was to preside nuremberg where in virtue of the golden bull it ought to have been held being desolated by the plague it had been summoned to meet at worms on the sixth of january fifteen twenty one never had a diet been attended by so many princes all desired to be present at this first act of the government of the young emperor and to make a display of their power among others, the young landgrave, Philip of Hesse, who was afterwards to play so important a part in the Reformation, arrived at Worms in the middle of January, with six hundred cavaliers, among them men of renowned valour. But there was a still more powerful motive which induced the electors, dukes, archbishops, landgraves, margraves, bishops, barons, and lords of the empire, as well as the deputies of towns and the ambassadors of the kings of christendom at this moment to throng the roads leading to worms with their brilliant equipages it had been announced that the diet would be occupied with the nomination of a council of regency to govern the empire during the absence of charles with the jurisdiction of the imperial chamber and other important questions but the public attention was particularly directed to another matter, which the emperor had also mentioned in his letter convening the Diet, that is, the Reformation. 
the great interests of politics trembled before the cause of the monk of wittemberg this cause was the principal subject of conversation among all personages who arrived at worms everything announced that the diet would be difficult and stormy charles scarcely twenty years of age pale and sickly yet as skilful as any one in the graceful management of his horse and in breaking a lance of a character imperfectly developed and with a grave and melancholy but still benevolent expression of countenance gave no proof as yet of distinguished talent and seemed not to have adopted a decided course the able and active william of croix lord of chievre who was his grand chamberlain his governor and prime minister and possessed absolute authority at the court died at worms numerous ambitious projects were competing with each other many passions were in collision the spaniards and belgians were eager to insinuate themselves into the councils of the young prince the nuncios multiplied their intrigues while the princes of germany spoke out boldly a struggle might have been foreseen yet a struggle in which the principal part would be performed by the secret movements of factions charles opened the diet on the twenty eighth of january fifteen twenty one being the festival of charlemagne he had a high idea of the importance of the imperial dignity in his opening address he said that no monarchy could be compared to the roman empire to which of old almost the whole world had been subject that unhappily the empire was now only the shadow of what it had been but that he hoped by means of his kingdoms and powerful alliances to re-establish it in its ancient glory but numerous difficulties immediately presented themselves to the young emperor how will he act placed as he is between the papal nuncio and the elector to whom he owes his crown how can he avoid dissatisfying aleander or frederick the former urged the emperor to execute the papal bull and the latter begged him to undertake nothing against the monk without giving him a hearing wishing to please these two opposite parties the young prince during a sojourn at oppenheim had written to the elector to bring luther to the diet assuring him that no injustice would be done him that he would meet with no violence and that learned men would confer with him this letter of charles accompanied by letters from chievre and the count of nassau threw the elector into great perplexity an alliance with the pope might at any instant become necessary to the young and ambitious emperor and in that case it was all over with luther frederick by taking the reformer to worms was perhaps taking him to the scaffold and yet the orders of charles were express the elector ordered spalatine to acquaint luther with the letters which he had received the enemy said the chaplain to him is putting everything in operation to hasten on the affair luther's friends trembled but he trembled not he was then in very feeble health no matter if i cannot go to worms in health replied he to the elector i will make myself be carried since the emperor calls me i cannot doubt but it is a call from god himself if they mean to employ violence against me as is probable for assuredly it is not with a view to their own instruction that they make me appear i leave the matter in the hands of the lord he who preserved the three young men in the furnace still lives and reigns if he is not pleased to save me my life is but a small matter only let us not allow the gospel to be exposed to the derision of the wicked and let us shed our blood for it sooner than permit them to triumph whether would my life or my death contribute most to the general safety it is not for us to decide let us only pray to god that our young emperor may not commence his reign with dipping his hands in my blood i would far rather perish by the sword of the romans you know what judgments befell the emperor sigismund after the murder of john huss 
expect everything of me save flight and recantation i cannot fly still less can i recant before receiving this letter from luther the elector had taken his resolution as he was advancing in the knowledge of the gospel he began to be more decided in his measures seeing that the conference of worms could not have a happy result he wrote to the emperor it seems to me difficult to bring luther with me to worms relieve me from the task besides i have never wished to take his doctrine under my protection but only to prevent him from being condemned without a hearing the legates without waiting for your orders have proceeded to take a step insulting both to luther and to me and i much fear that in this way they have hurried him on to an imprudent act which might expose him to great danger were he to appear at the diet the elector alluded to the pile which had consumed the papal bull but the rumour of luther's journey to worms had already spread men eager for novelty rejoiced at it the emperor's courtiers were alarmed but no one felt so indignant as the papal legate aleander on his journey had seen how deep an impression the gospel which luther preached had made on all classes of society literary men lawyers nobles the lower clergy the regular orders and the people were gained to the reformation these friends of the new doctrine carried their heads erect and were bold in their language while fear and terror froze the partisans of rome the papacy stood still but its props were shaking a noise of devastation was already heard somewhat resembling the creaking which takes place at the time when a mountain begins to slip aleander during his journey to worms was sadly annoyed when he had to dine or sleep neither literary men nor nobles nor priests even among the supposed friends of the pope durst receive him and the proud nuncio was obliged to seek an asylum in the taverns of the lowest class he was thus in terror and had no doubt that his life was in great danger in this way he arrived at worms and thenceforth to his roman fanaticism was added resentment for the personal injuries which he had received he immediately put every means in operation to prevent the audacious compearance of the redoubtable luther would it not be scandalous said he to see laix reinvestigating a cause which the pope had already condemned nothing alarms a roman courtier so much as an investigation and moreover an investigation to take place in germany and not at rome how humiliating even should luther's condemnation be unanimously decided and it was not even certain that such would be the result will not the powerful word of luther which has already done such havoc involve many princes and nobles in inevitable ruin aleander when before charles insisted implored threatened and spoke out as nuncio of the head of the church charles yielded and wrote to the elector that the time granted to luther having already elapsed the monk was under papal excommunication and that therefore unless he were willing to retract his writings frederick must leave him at wittemberg frederick had already quitted saxony without luther i pray the lord to be favourable to our elector were the words of melancthon on seeing him depart on him our hopes of the restoration of christendom repose his enemies dare everything but god will bring to naught the counsel of ahithophel as for us let us do our part in the combat by our lessons and our prayers luther was deeply grieved at being prohibited to appear at worms aleander did not consider it enough that luther should not come to worms he wished him to be condemned returning incessantly to the charge before the princes prelates and different members of the diet he accused the augustine monk not only of disobedience and heresy but also of sedition rebellion impiety and blasphemy the very accent in which he spoke betrayed the passions by which he was actuated 
so that men exclaimed it is hatred and love of vengeance rather than zeal and piety that excite him however frequent however vehement his discourses were he made no converts some pointed out to him that the papal bull had condemned luther only conditionally others did not altogether conceal the joy which they felt at seeing roman pride humbled the ministers of the emperor on the one hand and the ecclesiastical electors on the other affected great coldness the former to make the pope more sensible how necessary it was for him to league with their master the latter in order to induce him to pay better for their favour a conviction of luther's innocence prevailed in the assembly and aleander could not restrain his indignation but the coldness of the diet did not try the patience of the legate so much as the coldness of rome rome which had so long refused to take a serious view of the quarrel of the drunk german had no idea that a bull of the sovereign pontiff could prove insufficient to make him humble and submissive she had accordingly resumed her wonted security no longer sending either bull or purses of money but how was it possible without money to succeed in such a business rome must be awakened and aleander gives the alarm writing to the cardinal de medicis he says germany is detaching herself from rome and the princes are detaching themselves from the pope a few delays more a few more attempts at compromise and the matter is past hope money money or germany is lost at this cry rome awakes the servants of the papacy laying aside their torpor hastily forge their dreaded thunder at the vatican the pope issues a new bull and the excommunication which till then the heretical doctor had been merely threatened is in distinct terms pronounced against him and all his adherents rome herself breaking the last thread which still attached him to her church gave luther greater freedom and thereby greater power thundered at by the pope he with new affection took refuge in christ driven from the external temple he felt more strongly that he was himself a temple inhabited by god it is a glorious thing said he that we sinners in believing on jesus christ and eating his flesh have him within us with all his strength power wisdom and justice according as it is written he who believeth in me dwelleth in me and i in him admirable dwelling marvellous tabernacle far superior to that of moses and all magnificently adorned within with superb tapestry veils of purple and furniture of gold while without as on the tabernacle which god ordered to be constructed in the wilderness of sinai is seen only a rough covering of beaver's skins or goat's hair christians often stumble and in external appearance are all feebleness and disgrace but no matter within this infirmity and folly dwells secretly a power which the world cannot know but which overcomes the world for christ remaineth in them i have sometimes seen christians walking with a halt and in great weakness but when the hour of combat or appearance of the world's bar arrived christ of a sudden acted within them and they become so strong and resolute that the devil in dismay fled before them in regard to luther such an hour was about to peal and christ in whose communion he dwelt was not to forsake him meanwhile rome naturally rejected him the reformer and all his partisans whatever their rank and power were anathematized and deprived personally as well as in their descendants of all their dignities and effects every faithful christian as he loved his soul's salvation was ordered to shun the sight of the accursed crew wherever heresy has been introduced the priests were on sundays and festivals at the hour when the churches were best filled solemnly to publish the excommunication they were to carry away the vessels and ornaments of the altar and lay the cross upon the ground 
twelve priests with torches in their hands were to kindle them and dash them down with violence and extinguish them by trampling them with their feet then the bishop was to publish the condemnation of the impious men all the bells were to be rung the bishops and priests were to pronounce anathemas and maledictions and preach forcibly against luther and his adherents twenty-two days had elapsed since the excommunication had been published at rome and it was perhaps not yet known in germany when luther learning that there was again some talk of calling him to worms addressed the elector in a letter written in such terms that frederick might communicate it to the diet luther wished to correct the erroneous impression of the princes and frankly explain to this august tribunal the true nature of a cause which was so much misapprehended i rejoice with all my heart most serene lord said he that his imperial majesty means to bring this affair under consideration i call jesus christ to witness that it is the cause of germany of the catholic church of the christian world and of god himself and not of any single man and more especially such a man as i i am ready to repair to worms provided i have a safe conduct and learned pious and impartial judges i am ready to answer for it is not in a spirit of rashness or with a view to personal advantage that i have taught the doctrine with which i am reproached i have done it in obedience to my conscience and to the oath which as doctor i took to the holy scriptures i have done it for the glory of god the safety of the christian church the good of the german nation and the extirpation of many superstitions abuses and evils disgrace tyranny blasphemy and impiety this declaration in the solemn circumstances in which luther made it is deserving of our attention we see here the motives which influenced him and the primary causes which led to the renovation of christian society these were something more than monkish jealousy or a wish to marry end of book seven chapter one book seven chapter two of history of the reformation in the sixteenth century volume two by jean henri mel d'aubigne translated by henry beveridge this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two but all this was of no importance in the eyes of politicians how high soever the idea which charles entertained of the imperial dignity it was not in germany that his interests and policy centred he was always a duke of burgundy who to several sceptres added the first crown of christendom strange at the moment of her thorough transformation germany selected for her head a foreign prince in whose eyes her wants and tendencies were only of secondary importance the religious movement it is true was not indifferent to the young emperor but it was important in his eyes only in so far as it menaced the pope war between charles and france was inevitable and its chief seat was necessarily to be in italy an alliance with the pope thus became every day more necessary to the schemes of charles he would fain have either detached frederick from luther or satisfied the pope without offending frederick several of those about him manifested in regard to the affairs of the augustin monk that cold disdain which politicians usually affect when religion is in question let us avoid extremes said they let us trammel luther by negotiations and reduce him to silence by some kind of concession the true course is to stifle the embers not stir them up if the monk is caught in the net we have gained the day by accepting a compromise he will be interdicted and undone for appearance some external reforms will be devised the elector will be satisfied the pope will be gained and affairs will resume their ordinary course such was the project of the confidential counsellors of the emperor the doctors of wittemberg seemed to have divined this new policy 
they are trying in secret to gain men's minds said melanchthon and are working in darkness john glapio the confessor of charles v a man of rank a skilful courtier and an intriguing monk undertook the execution of the project glapio possessed the entire confidence of charles who in accordance with spanish manners left to him almost entirely the management of matters relating to religion as soon as charles was appointed emperor leo x had assiduously endeavoured to gain glapio by favours to which the confessor was strongly alive there was no way in which he could make a better return to the pope's kindness than by reducing heresy to silence and he accordingly set about the task one of the elector's counsellors was chancellor gregory brooke or pontanus a man of great intelligence decision and courage who knew more of theology than all the doctors and whose wisdom was a match for the wiles of the monks at the emperor's court glapio aware of the influence of the chancellor asked an interview with him and coming up to him as if he had been the friend of the reformer said to him with an expression of good will i was delighted when on reading the first productions of luther i found him a vigorous stock which had pushed forth noble branches and which gave promise to the church of the most precious fruits several before him it is true made the same discoveries still none but he has had the noble courage to publish the truth without fear but when i read his book on the captivity of babylon i felt as if beaten and bruised from head to foot i don't believe added the monk that luther acknowledges himself to be the author i do not find in it either his style or his science after some discussion the confessor continued introduce me to the elector and i will in your presence explain to him the errors of luther the chancellor replied that the business of the diet did not leave any leisure to his highness who moreover did not meddle with the affair the monk was vexed when his request was denied by the way said the chancellor as you say there is no evil without a remedy will you explain yourself assuming a confidential air the confessor replied the emperor earnestly desires to see such a man as luther reconciled to the church for his books before the publication of his treatise on the captivity of babylon rather pleased his majesty it must doubtless have been luther's rage at the bull which dictated that work let him declare that he did not wish to disturb the peace of the church and the learned of all nations will rally around him procure me an audience with his highness the chancellor waited upon frederick the elector being well aware that any kind of recantation was impossible replied tell the confessor that i cannot comply with his request but do you continue the conference glapio received this message with great demonstrations of respect and changing the attack said let the elector name some confidential persons to deliberate on this affair chancellor the elector does not profess to defend the cause of luther confessor very well do you at least discuss it with me jesus christ is my witness that all i do is from love to the church and to luther who has opened so many hearts to the truth the chancellor having refused to undertake what was the reformer's own task was preparing to retire stay said the monk to him chancellor what then is to be done confessor let luther deny that he is the author of the captivity of babylon chancellor but the papal bull condemns all his other works confessor it is because of his obstinacy if he retracts his book the pope in the plenitude of his power can easily restore him to favour what hopes may we not cherish now that we have so excellent an emperor perceiving that these words made some impression on the chancellor the monk hastened to add luther always insists on arguing from the bible the bible it is like wax and may be stretched and bent at pleasure 
i undertake to find in the bible opinions still more extraordinary than those of luther he is mistaken when he converts all the sayings of jesus into commandments then wishing to work also on the fears of the chancellor he added what would happen if to-day or to-morrow the emperor were to try the effect of arms think of it he then allowed pontanus to retire the confessor prepared new snares after living ten years with him said erasmus we should not know him what an excellent book that of luther's on christian liberty said he to the chancellor when he saw him a few days after what wisdom what talent what intellect it is just the style in which a true scholar ought to write let unexceptionable persons be chosen on either side and let the pope and luther refer to their judgment no doubt luther has the best of it on several articles i will speak to the emperor himself on the subject believe me i do not say these things to you on my own suggestion i have told the emperor that god will chastise him as well as all the princes if the church which is the spouse of jesus christ is not washed from all the stains by which she is polluted i have added that god himself had raised up luther and had ordered him to rebuke men sharply using him as a rod to punish the sins of the world the chancellor hearing these words they convey the impression of the time and show what was then thought of luther even by his opponents thought it right to express his astonishment that more respect was not shown to his master deliberations on this subject said he are daily carried on before the emperor and the elector is not invited to them it seems strange that the emperor who owes him some gratitude excludes him from his counsels confessor i have been present only once at these deliberations and i have heard the emperor resist the solicitations of the nuncios five years hence it will be seen how much charles should have done for the reformation of the church the elector replied pontanus is ignorant of the emperor's intentions he should be invited that he may hear them stated the confessor answered with a deep sigh i call god to witness how ardently i desire to see the reformation of christendom accomplished to lengthen out the affair and meanwhile keep luther's mouth shut was all that glapio had in view at all events luther must not come to worms a dead man returning from the other world and appearing in the midst of the diet would not have alarmed the nuncios and monks and whole host of the pope so much as the sight of the wittemberg doctor how many days does it take to come from wittemberg to worms asked the monk at the chancellor affecting an air of indifference then begging pontanus to present his very humble respects to the elector he departed such were the manoeuvres of the courtiers the firmness of pontanus outwitted them this upright man was immovable as a rock in all negotiations moreover the roman monks fell into the very snares which they were laying for their enemies the christian says luther in his figurative language is like a bird fastened near a trap the wolves and foxes go round and round and make a dart upon it to devour it but fall into the pit and perish while the timid bird remains alive thus holy angels guard us and devouring wolves hypocrites and persecutors cannot do us any harm not only were the confessor's artifices unavailing but moreover his admissions confirmed frederick in the belief that luther was in the right and that it was his duty to defend him the hearts of men became every day more inclined towards the gospel a prior of the dominicans proposed that the emperor the kings of france spain england portugal hungary and poland the pope and the electors should name representatives by whom the matter should be decided never said he has reference been made to the pope alone the general feeling became such that it seemed impossible to condemn luther without a hearing and regular conviction aleander became uneasy 
and displayed more than wonted energy it is no longer merely against the elector and luther that he has to contend he is horrified at the secret negotiations of the confessor the proposition of the prior the consent of charles's ministers and the extreme coldness of roman piety among the most devoted friends of the pope so that one would have thought says pallavicini that a torrent of ice had passed over them he had at length received gold and silver from rome and held in his hand energetic briefs addressed to the most powerful personages in the empire afraid that his prey might escape he felt that now was the time to strike a decisive blow he dispatched the briefs showered gold and silver with liberal hand dealt out the most enticing promises and provided says the cardinal historian with this triple weapon he strove anew to turn the wavering assembly of the electors in favour of the pope he laboured above all to encircle the emperor with his snares availing himself of the differences between the belgian and the spanish ministers he laid close siege to the prince all the friends of rome awakened by his voice urged young charles with solicitations every day wrote the elector to his brother john deliberations are held against luther the demand is that he be put under the ban of the pope and the emperor in all sorts of ways attempts are made to hurt him those who parade about with their red hats the romans with all their sect labor in the task with indefatigable zeal in fact aleander urged the condemnation of the reformer with a violence which luther terms marvellous fury the apostate nuncio as luther calls him hurried by passion beyond the bounds of prudence one day exclaimed if you mean o germans to shake off the yoke of roman obedience we will act so that setting the one against the other as an exterminating sword you will all perish in your own blood such adds the reformer is the pope's method of feeding the sheep of christ luther himself spoke a very different language he made no demand of a personal nature luther is ready said melanchthon to purchase the glory and advancement of the gospel with his life but he trembled at the thought of the disasters of which his death might be the signal he saw a people led astray and perhaps avenging his martyrdom in the blood of his enemies especially the priests he recoiled from the fearful responsibility god said he arrests the fury of his enemies but should it break forth a storm will burst upon the priests similar to that which ravaged bohemia i am clear of it for i have earnestly besought the german nobility to arrest the romans by wisdom and not by the sword to war upon priests a body without courage and strength is to war upon women and children charles did not withstand the solicitations of the nuncio his belgian and spanish devotion had been developed by his preceptor adrian who afterwards occupied the pontifical throne the pope had addressed a brief to him imploring him to give legal effect to the bull by an imperial edict in vain said he to him shall god have invested you with the sword of supreme power if you do not employ it both against infidels and also against heretics who are far worse than infidels one day accordingly in the beginning of february at the moment when everything was ready at worms for a brilliant tournament and after the emperor's tent had actually been erected the princes who were preparing to attend the fete were summoned to repair to the imperial palace there the papal bull was read to them and they were presented with a stringent edict enjoining the execution of it if you have anything better to propose added the emperor in the usual form i am ready to hear you animated debates then began in the diet the monk wrote the deputy of one of the german free towns gives us a great deal to do some would like to crucify him and i don't think he will escape the only thing to be feared is that he may rise again on the third day 
the emperor had thought he would be able to publish his edict without opposition on the part of the states but it was not so men's minds were not prepared and it was necessary to gain the diet convince this assembly said the young monarch to the nuncio this was just what aleander desired and he received a promise of being admitted to the diet on the thirteenth of february end of book seven chapter two book seven chapter three of history of the reformation in the sixteenth century volume two by jean henri mel d'aubigne translated by henry beveridge this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three the nuncio prepared for the solemn audience the task was important but aleander was worthy of it the ambassador of the sovereign pontiff was surrounded with all the splendour of his office he was moreover one of the most eloquent men of his age the friends of the reformation looked forward to the sitting not without fear the elector under the pretext of indisposition kept away but he ordered some of his counsellors to attend and give heed to the nuncio's address on the appointed day aleander proceeded to the hall of the assembled princes men's minds were excited several thought of annas or caiaphas repairing to pilate's judgment hall to demand the life of him who was perversing the nation at the moment when the nuncio was about to step across the threshold the officer of the diet says pallavicini came briskly up to him took him by the breast and shoved him back he was a lutheran at heart adds the roman historian if the story is true it doubtless betrays strange passion in the officer but at the same time gives an idea of the powerful influence which luther's doctrine had produced even on the doorkeepers of the imperial council proud aleander haughtily drawing himself up moved on and entered the hall never had rome been called to make her apology before so august an assembly the nuncio placed before him the judicial documents which he judged necessary the works of luther and the papal bulls silence being called he spoke as follows most august emperor most puissant princes most excellent deputies i come before you to maintain a cause for which my heart burns with the most ardent affection the subject is the preservation on my master's head of that tiara which is reverenced by all the maintenance of that papal throne for which i am ready to give my body to the flames could the monster who has engendered the growing heresy be consumed by the same pile and mingle his ashes with mine no the disagreement between luther and rome turns not on the interests of the pope luther's books are before me and any man with eyes in his head may perceive that the holy doctrines of the church are the object of his attack he teaches that those only communicate worthily whose consciences are filled with sadness and confusion for their sins and that there is no justification in baptism without faith in the promise of which baptism is the pledge he denies the necessity of our works to obtain celestial glory he denies that we have liberty and power to observe natural and divine law he affirms that we sin necessarily in all our actions did ever the arsenal of hell send forth arrows better fitted to loose the reins of modesty he preaches the abolition of religious vows can more sacrilegious impiety be imagined what desolation will not be seen in the world when those who ought to be the leaven of the people shall have thrown aside their sacred vestments abandoned the temples which re-echoed with their holy hymns and plunged into adultery incest and dissoluteness shall i enumerate all the crimes of this audacious monk he sins against the dead for he denies purgatory he sins against heaven for he says he would not believe an angel from heaven he sins against the church 
for he pretends that all Christians are priests. He sins against the saints, for he despises their venerable writings. He sins against councils, for he terms that of Constance an assembly of demons. He sins against the world, for he forbids the punishment of death to be inflicted on any one who has not committed a mortal sin. Some say he is a pious man. I have no wish to attack his life. I would only remind this assembly that the devil deceives men by semblances of truth. Aleander, having spoken of the condemnation of purgatory by the Council of Florence, laid the papal bull on this council at the feet of the emperor. The Archbishop of Mentz took it up and handed it to the Archbishops of Cologne and Treves, who received it reverently and passed it to the other princes. The nuncio, having thus accused Luther, now proceeded to the second point, which was to justify Rome. At Rome, says Luther, they promise one thing with the lip and do its opposite with the hand. If this fact is true, must not the inference be the very reverse of what he draws from it? If the ministers of a religion live conformably to its precepts, it is a proof that it is false. Such was the religion of the ancient Romans. Such is that of Mahomet, and that of Luther himself, but such is not the religion which the pontiffs of Rome teach us. Yes, the doctrine which they confess condemns all as faulty, several as culpable, and some even, I say it candidly, as criminal. This doctrine delivers their actions to the censure of men during their life, and to historical infamy after their death. Now what pleasure, what advantage, I ask, could the pontiffs have found in inventing such a religion? The church, it will be said, was not governed in primitive times by Roman pontiffs. What must the conclusion be? With such arguments they might persuade men to live on acorns, and princesses to be their own washerwomen. But it was against his adversary, the reformer, that the nuncio chiefly directed his attack. Full of indignation against those who said that he ought to be heard, he exclaimed, Luther will not allow any one to instruct him. The Pope summoned him to Rome, but he did not obey. The Pope summoned him to Augsburg before his legate, and he would not appear without a safe conduct from the Emperor, that is, until the hands of the legate were tied, and nothing left free to him but his tongue. Ah, said Aleander, turning towards Charles V, I supplicate your imperial majesty not to do what would issue in disgrace. Interfere not with a matter of which laics have no right to take cognizance. Do your own work. Let Luther's doctrine be interdicted throughout the empire. Let his writings be everywhere burnt. Fear not, there is enough in the writings of Luther to burn a hundred thousand heretics. And what have we to fear? The populace? Before the battle they seem terrible from their insolence. In the battle they are contemptible from their cowardice. Foreign princes? The king of France has prohibited Luther's doctrine from entering his kingdom, while the king of Great Britain is preparing a blow for it with his royal hand. You know what the feelings of Hungary, Italy, and Spain are, and none of your neighbours, however great soever the enmity he may bear to yourself, wishes you anything so bad as this heresy. If the house of our enemy is adjacent to our own, we may wish him fever, but not pestilence. Who are all these Lutherans? A huddle of insolent grammarians, corrupt priests, disorderly monks, ignorant advocates, degraded nobles, common people, misled and perverted. Is not the Catholic party far more numerous, able and powerful? A unanimous decree of this assembly will enlighten the simple, give warning to the imprudent, determine those who are hesitating, and confirm the feeble. But if the axe is not laid to the root of this poisonous shrub, if the fatal stroke is not given to it, then I see it covering the heritage of Jesus Christ with its branches, changing the vineyard of the Lord into a howling forest, transforming the kingdom of God into a den of wild beasts, 
and throwing germany into the frightful state of barbarism and desolation to which asia has been reduced by the superstition of mahomet the nuncio ceased he had spoken for three hours the torrent of his eloquence had moved the assembly the princes shaken and alarmed said cochleus looked at each other and murmurs were soon heard from different quarters against luther and his partisans had the mighty luther been present had he been permitted to answer the discourse had he availing himself of the concession forced from the roman orator by the remembrance of his old master the infamous borgia been permitted to show that these arguments designed to defend rome constituted her condemnation and that the doctrine which gave proof of her iniquity was not invented by him as the orator said but was the very religion which christ had given to the world and which the reformation was establishing in its primitive lustre could he have presented an exact and animated picture of the errors and abuses of the papacy and show how it had perverted the religion of jesus christ into an instrument of aggrandizement and rapine the effect of the nuncio's harangue would have been neutralized at the moment of its delivery but nobody rose to speak the assembly remained under the impression of the address and excited and carried away showed themselves ready violently to eradicate the heresy of luther from the soil of the empire still the victory was only apparent it was the will of god that rome should have an opportunity of displaying her reasons and her strength the greatest of her orators had addressed the assembled princes and said all that rome had to say but the last effort of the papacy was the very thing which was destined to become in regard to several of those who witnessed it the signal of her defeat if in order to secure the triumph of truth it is necessary to proclaim it aloud so in order to secure the destruction of error it is sufficient to publish it without reserve neither the one nor the other in order to accomplish its course should be concealed the light judges all things end of book seven chapter three book seven chapter four of history of the reformation in the sixteenth century volume two by jean henri mel d'aubigne translated by henry beveridge this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four a few days sufficed to wear off these first impressions as always happens when an orator shrouds the emptiness of his arguments in high-sounding phrases the majority of the princes were ready to sacrifice luther but none were disposed to sacrifice the rights of the empire and the redress of german grievances there was no objection to give up the insolent monk who had dared to speak so loud but it was wished to make the pope so much the more sensible of the justice of a reform which was demanded by the heads of the kingdom accordingly it was the greatest personal enemy of luther duke george of saxony who spoke most energetically against the encroachments of rome the grandson of podiabrad king of bohemia repulsed by the doctrines of grace which the reformer proclaimed had not yet abandoned the hope of seeing a moral and ecclesiastical reform and what irritated him so much against the monk of wittemberg was that he had spoiled the whole affair by his despised doctrines but now seeing the nuncio sought to confound luther and reform in one common condemnation george suddenly stood up among the assembled princes and to the great astonishment of those who knew his hatred of the reformer said the diet must not forget the grievances of which it complains against the court of rome what abuses have crept into our states the annats which the emperor granted freely for the good of christendom now demanded as a debt the roman courtiers every day inventing new ordinances in order to absorb sell and farm out ecclesiastical benefices a multitude of transgressions winked at rich offenders unworthily tolerated while those who have no means of ransom are punished without pity 
the popes incessantly bestowing expectancies and reversions on the inmates of their palace to the detriment of those to whom the benefices belong the commendams of abbeys and convents of rome conferred on cardinals bishops and prelates who appropriate their revenues so that there is not one monk in convents which ought to have twenty or thirty stations multiplied without end and indulgence shops established in all the streets and squares of our cities shops of st anthony shops of the holy spirit of st hubert of st cornelius of st vincent and many others besides societies purchasing from rome the right of holding such markets then purchasing from their bishop the right of exhibiting their wares and in order to procure all this money draining and emptying the pockets of the poor the indulgences which ought to be granted solely for the salvation of souls and which ought to be merited only by prayers fastings and the salvation of souls sold at a regular price the officials of the bishop oppressing those in humble life with penances for blasphemy adultery debauchery the violation of this or that feast day while at the same time not even censuring ecclesiastics who are guilty of the same crimes penances imposed on the penitent and artfully arranged so that he soon falls anew into the same fault and pays so much the more money such are some of the crying abuses of rome all sense of shame has been cast off and one thing only is pursued money money hence preachers who ought to teach the truth now do nothing more than retail lies lies which are not only tolerated but recompensed because the more they lie the more they gain from this polluted well comes forth all this polluted water debauchery goes hand in hand with avarice the officials cause women to come to their houses under divers pretexts and strive to seduce them sometimes by menaces sometimes by presents or if they cannot succeed injure them in their reputation ah the scandals caused by the clergy precipitate multitudes of poor souls into eternal condemnation there must be a universal reform and this reform must be accomplished by summoning a general council wherefore most excellent princes and lords with submission i implore you to lose no time in the consideration of this matter several days after aleander's address duke george produced the list of grievances which he had enumerated this important document is preserved in the archives of weimar luther had not spoken more forcibly against the abuses of rome but he had done something more the duke pointed out the evil luther had along with the evil pointed out both the cause and the cure he had shown that the sinner receives the true indulgence that which comes from god solely by faith in the grace and merits of jesus christ and this simple but powerful doctrine had overturned all the markets established by the priests how can one become pious asked he one day a cordelier will reply put on a grey hood and tie a cord round your waist a roman will reply hear mass and fast but a christian will say faith in christ alone justifies and saves before works we must have eternal life after we are born anew and made children of god by the word of grace then it is we do good works the duke spoke the language of a secular prince luther the language of a reformer the great sore of the church was that she had devoted herself entirely to externals had made all her works and her graces to consist of outward and material things indulgences had carried this to its extreme point and pardon the most spiritual thing in christianity had been purchased in shops like meat and drink the great work of luther consisted in his availing himself of this extreme point in the degeneracy of christendom in order to bring back the individual and the church to the primitive source of life and to re-establish the reign of the holy spirit within the sanctuary of the heart 
here as often happens the cure sprung out of the disease and the two extremes met henceforward the church which during so many ages had been developed externally by ceremonies observances and human practices began again to be developed within by faith hope and charity the duke's address produced the greater effect from his opposition to luther being well known other members of the diet stated different grievances the ecclesiastical princes themselves supported these complaints we have a pontiff said they who spends his life in hunting and pleasure the benefices of germany are given at rome to huntsmen domestics grooms stable boys body servants and other people of that class ignorant unpolished people without capacity and entire strangers to germany the diet appointed a commission to collect all these grievances their number was found to be a hundred and one a deputation consisting of secular and ecclesiastical princes presented the list to the emperor imploring him to give redress as he had engaged to do at his election how many christian souls are lost said they to charles v how many depredations how much extortion are caused by the scandals with which the spiritual chief of christendom is environed the ruin and dishonour of our people must be prevented therefore we all in a body supplicate you most humbly but also most urgently to ordain a general reformation to undertake it and to accomplish it there was at this time in christian society an unseen power influencing princes and their subjects a wisdom from above dragging forward even the adversaries of the reformation and preparing that emancipation whose appointed hour had at length arrived charles could not be insensible to these remonstrances of the empire neither himself nor the nuncio had expected them his confessor had even denounced the vengeance of heaven against him if he did not reform the church the emperor immediately withdrew the edict which ordered luther's writings to be committed to the flames in every part of the empire and in its place substituted a provisional order remitting these books to the magistrates this did not satisfy the assembly who were desirous that the reformer should appear it is unjust said his friends to condemn luther without having heard him and without knowing from himself whether he is the author of the books which are proposed to be burnt his doctrine said his opponents has so taken possession of men's hearts that it is impossible to arrest their progress without hearing him there need be no discussion with him if he avows his writings and refuses to retract them then all of us electors princes states of the whole empire true to the faith of our ancestors will in a body aid your majesty by all the means in our power in the execution of your decrees aleander alarmed dreading both the intrepidity of luther and the ignorance of the princes immediately set himself to the task of preventing the reformer's compearance he went from the ministers of charles to the princes who were the most disposed to favour the pope and from these princes to the emperor himself it is unlawful said he to bring into question what the sovereign pontiff has decided there will be no discussion with luther you say but continued he will not the power of this audacious man will not the fire of his eye and the eloquence of his tongue and the mysterious spirit which animates him be sufficient to excite some sedition several already venerate him as a saint and you everywhere meet with his portrait surrounded with a halo of glory as around the head of the blessed if it is determined to cite him at least let it be without giving him the protection of public faith these last words were meant to frighten luther or prepare his ruin the nuncio found easy access to the grandees of spain in spain as in germany the opposition to the dominican inquisitors was national the yoke of the inquisition which had been discontinued for a time had just been re-established by charles a numerous party in the peninsula sympathized with luther 
but it was not so with the great who on the banks of the rhine again met with what they had hated beyond the pyrenees inflamed with the most violent fanaticism they were bent on annihilating the new heresy in particular frederick duke of alba was transported with rage whenever the subject of reformation was mooted his wish would have been to wade in the blood of all its adherents luther had not yet been called to appear and yet his mere name was already agitating all the grandees of christendom then assembled at worms the man who was thus agitating the mighty of the earth was the only one who seemed to be at peace the news from worms were alarming even luther's friends were frightened nothing now is left us but our wishes and our prayers wrote melanchthon to spalatin oh if god would deign to ransom the safety of the christian people by my blood but luther was a stranger to fear shutting himself up in his peaceful cell he sat down to meditate applying to himself the words of mary the mother of our lord when she exclaimed my soul doth magnify the lord and my spirit hath rejoiced in god my saviour for he that is mighty has done for me great things and holy is his name he has shown strength with his arm he hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree the following are some of the thoughts which filled luther's heart he that is mighty says mary oh how great boldness on the part of a young girl with a single word she strikes all the strong with languor all the mighty with feebleness all the wise with folly and all whose name is glorious on the earth with ignominy and lays at the feet of god all strength all power all wisdom all glory his arm continues she and she thus appeals to that power by which he acts of himself and without the agency of his creatures a mysterious power operating in secrecy and in silence until his purpose is accomplished hence destruction comes before any one is aware of its approach hence elevation when no one is thinking of it he leaves his children in oppression and feebleness so that each of them says to himself we are all lost then however they are most strong for it is where the power of man ends that the power of god begins only let faith wait upon him and on the other hand god permits his adversaries to increase their power and grandeur he withdraws from them the aid of his strength and leaves them to be inflated with their own he leaves them void of his eternal wisdom and lets them fill themselves with their wisdom of a day and while they rise up in the greatness of their might the arm of the lord keeps back and their work vanishes like a soap bubble when it bursts in the air it was on the tenth of march at the moment when his name was filling the imperial city with alarm that luther finished this exposition of the magnificat he was not allowed to remain tranquil in his retreat spalatin in conformity to the orders of the elector sent him a note of the articles of which it was proposed to demand a retraction from him a retraction after the refusal at augsburg fear not he wrote to spalatin that i will retract a single syllable since their only argument is to insist that my writings are opposed to the rights of what they call the church if the emperor charles summon me merely for the purpose of retracting i will answer him that i will remain here and it will be just the same thing as if i had been to worms and come back again but if on the contrary the emperor chooses to summon me in order that i may be put to death i am ready to repair at his call for with the help of christ i will not desert his word on the battlefield i know it these bloody men will never rest till they have deprived me of life oh that none but papists would become guilty of my blood end of book seven chapter four
book seven chapter five of history of the reformation in the sixteenth century volume two by jean henri mail d'aubigne translated by henry beveridge this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five at length the emperor decided the appearance of luther before the diet seemed the only thing fitted to bring this affair which occupied the whole empire to some kind of termination charles v resolved to cite him but without giving him a safe conduct here frederick again began to act as his protector everybody saw the danger which threatened the reformer luther's friends says cochleus were afraid that he would be delivered up to the pope or that the emperor himself would put him to death as unworthy on account of his obstinate heresy that any faith should be kept with him on this subject there was a long and keen debate among the princes struck at last with the general agitation then prevailing almost throughout the whole population of germany and afraid that as luther passed along some sudden tumult or dangerous sedition might break forth doubtless in favour of the reformer the princes deemed it wise to calm men's minds on his account and not only the emperor but also the elector of saxony duke george and the landgrave of hesse through whose states he had to pass each gave him a safe conduct on the sixth of march fifteen twenty one charles v signed the following summons addressed to luther charles by the grace of god elected roman emperor always augustus etc etc honourable dear and pious we and the states of the holy empire having resolved to make an inquest touching the doctrine and the books which you have published for some time past have given you to come here and return to a place of safety our safe conduct and that of the empire here subjoined our sincere desire is that you immediately prepare for this journey in order that in the space of twenty-one days mentioned in our safe conduct you may be here certainly and without fail have no apprehension of either injustice or violence we will firmly enforce our safe conduct under written and we expect that you will answer to our call in so doing you will follow our serious advice given at our imperial city of worms the sixth day of march in the year of our lord fifteen hundred and twenty one and in the second of our reign charles by order of my lord the emperor with his own hand albert cardinal of mentz arch chancellor nicholas Zwill the safe conduct enclosed in this letter bore the following address to the honourable our dear and pious doctor martin luther of the order of the augustines it began thus we charles fifth of the name by the grace of god elected roman emperor always augustus king of spain of the two sicilies of jerusalem hungary dalmatia croatia etc archduke of austria duke of burgundy count of habsburg flanders the tyrol etc etc then the king of so many nations giving to wit that he had summoned before him an augustine monk named luther ordered all princes lords magistrates and others to respect the safe conduct which he gave him under pain of punishment by the emperor and the empire thus the emperor gave the title of dear honourable and pious to a man at whose head the church had launched her excommunication it had been wished in the drawing up of the document to remove all distrust from the mind of luther and his friends gaspard sturm was appointed to carry this message to the reformer and accompany him to worms the elector dreading the public indignation wrote on the twelfth of march to the magistrates of wittemberg to see to the safety of the emperor's officer and if deemed necessary to provide him with a guard the herald set out thus the designs of god were accomplished 
god was pleased to set upon a hill that light which he had kindled in the world and emperors kings and princes without knowing it were forthwith in motion to execute his design it is easy for him to exalt the lowest to the highest an act of his power suffices to raise the humble child of mansfeld from an obscure hut to the palace where kings are assembled in regard to him there is nothing small nothing great when he wills it charles v and luther meet face to face but will luther obey this citation his best friends were in doubt the elector on the twenty fifth of march wrote to his brother dr martin is summoned hither but i know not if he will come i cannot augur any good of it three weeks later sixteenth of april this excellent prince seeing the danger increase wrote anew to duke john there is a proclamation against luther the cardinals and bishops attack him with much severity may god turn all to good would to god i could procure him an equitable reception while these things were passing at worms and wittemberg the papacy was reiterating its blows on the twenty eighth of march the thursday before easter rome resounded with a solemn excommunication at this season it is usual to publish the dreadful bull in coena domini which is only a long series of imprecations on that day the avenues to the church in which the sovereign pontiff was to officiate were occupied at an early hour by the papal guards and by a crowd of people who had flocked from all parts of italy to receive the benediction of the holy father the square in front of the basilisk was decorated with branches of laurel and myrtle wax tapers were burning on the balcony of the church and the ostensorium was raised upon it all at once bells make the air re-echo with solemn sounds the pope clothed in his pontifical robes and carried in a chair appears on the balcony the people kneel all heads are uncovered the colours are lowered the muskets grounded and a solemn silence reigns some moments after the pope slowly stretches out his hands raises them towards heaven then bends them slowly towards the ground making the sign of the cross this movement is repeated thrice and the air echoes anew with the ringing of bells which intimate the pope's benediction to the surrounding country then priests advance with impetuosity holding lighted torches which they reverse brandish and throw about with violence to represent the flames of hell the people are moved and agitated and the words of malediction are heard from the height of the temple when luther was informed of this excommunication he published the tenor of it with some remarks written in that caustic style in which he so much excelled although this publication did not appear till afterwards we will here give some idea of it let us hear the high priest of christendom on the balcony of his basilisk and the monk of wittemberg answering him from the bosom of germany there is something characteristic in the contrast of the two voices the pope leo bishop luther bishop as a wolf is a shepherd for the bishop ought to exhort according to the doctrine of salvation not belch out imprecations and maledictions the pope servant of all the servants of god luther in the evening when we are drunk but in the morning we call ourselves leo lord of all the lords the pope the roman bishops our predecessors have been wont on this festival to employ weapons of righteousness luther which according to you are excommunication and anathema but according to st paul patience meekness and charity second corinthians chapter six verse seven the pope according to the duty of the apostolic office and to maintain the purity of the christian faith luther 
in other words the temporal possessions of the pope the pope and its unity which consists in the union of the members with christ their head and with his vicar luther for christ is not sufficient one more than he is necessary the pope to guard the holy communion of the faithful we follow the ancient custom and excommunicate and anathematize on the part of god almighty the father luther of whom it is said god sent not his son into the world to condemn the world john chapter 3 verse 17 the pope and the son and the holy spirit and according to the power of the apostles peter and paul and our own luther and myself says the ravenous wolf as if the power of god were too feeble without him the pope we curse all heretics the garasi the paterini the popers of Lyon the Arnoldists, the Speronists, the Passagians, the Wycliffites, the Hussites, the Fraticelli. Luther, for they wished to possess the Holy Scriptures, and insisted that the Pope should be sober and preach the Word of God. The Pope, and Martin Luther, recently condemned by us for a similar heresy, as well as all his adherents, and all whosoever they be, that show him any favour, luther i thank thee most gracious pontiff for condemning me in common with all these christians i count it an honour to have my name proclaimed at rome during the feast in so glorious a manner and carried over the world with the names of all those humble confessors of jesus christ the pope likewise we excommunicate and curse all pirates and corsairs luther who then is the greatest of pirates and corsairs if it be not he who robs souls chains them and puts them to death the pope particularly those who sail upon our sea luther our sea saint peter our predecessor said silver and gold have i none acts chapter three verse six jesus christ said the kings of the gentiles exercise lordship over them but it shall not be so with you luke chapter 22 verse 25 but if a wagon loaded with hay must on meeting with a drunken man give way to him a fortiori must st peter and jesus christ himself give way to the pope the pope likewise we excommunicate and curse all who falsify our bulls and our apostolic letters luther but the letters of god the scriptures of god all the world may condemn and burn the pope likewise we excommunicate and curse all who detain provisions which are on the way to rome luther he barks and bites like a dog threatened to be deprived of his bone the pope likewise we condemn and curse all who keep back judicial rights fruits tithes revenues appertaining to the clergy luther for jesus christ has said whosoever will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat let him have thy cloak also matthew five verse forty and this is our commentary on the passage the pope whatsoever be their station dignity order power or rank be they even bishops or kings luther for there will arise false teachers among you who will despise dominion and speak evil of dignities saith the scripture jude verse eight the pope likewise we condemn and curse all those who in any kind of way attack the city of rome the kingdom of sicily the islands of sardinia and corsica the patrimony of st peter in tuscany the duchy of spoleto the margravate of ancona the campagna the cities of ferrara and benevento or any other city or country appertaining to the church of rome luther o oh, peter poor fisherman where did you get rome and all those kingdoms i salute you peter king of sicily and fisherman at bethsaida 
the pope we excommunicate and curse all chancellors councillors parliaments procurators governors officials bishops and others who oppose our letters of exhortation invitation prohibition mediation execution etc luther for the holy see seeks only to live in idleness magnificence and debauchery to command storm deceive lie insult and commit all sorts of wickedness in peace and safety o lord arise it is not as the papists pretend thou hast not forsaken us nor is thy favour turned away from us so spake leo the tenth at rome and luther at wittenberg the pontiff having finished his anathemas the parchment on which they were written was torn in pieces and the fragments thrown to the people immediately there was a great rush among the crowd all pressing forward and striving to get hold of a morsel of the terrible bull such were the holy relics which the papacy offered to her faithful on the eve of the great day of grace of expiation the multitude soon dispersed and the vicinity of the basilisk resumed its wonted stillness let us return to wittemberg end of book seven chapter five Book seven, chapter six of History of the Reformation in the Sixteenth Century, Volume Two, by Jean Henri Mel Daubigné, translated by Henry Beveridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It was the twenty fourth of March. The Imperial Herald Gaspard Sturm, having at length passed the gates of the town where Luther was, presented himself before the doctor and put the summons of charles v into his hands a grave and solemn moment for the reformer all his friends were in consternation no prince not even excepting frederick the wise had as yet declared in his favour knights it is true uttered menaces but the mighty charles despised them still luther was not troubled the papists said he on seeing the anguish of his friends have no wish for my arrival at worms they only wish my condemnation and death no matter pray not for me but for the word of god before my blood is cold thousands throughout the world will be called to answer for having shed it the most holy adversary of christ the father master and generalissimo of homicides insists on having my life amen let the will of the lord be done christ will give me his spirit to vanquish these ministers of error i despise them during my life and will triumph over them by my death they are doing all they can at worms to compel me to retract here then will be my retraction i once said that the pope was the vicar of christ now i say that he is the enemy of the lord and the apostle of the devil and when he learned that all the pulpits of the franciscans were resounding with imprecations and maledictions against him he exclaimed oh what wondrous joy it gives me he knew that he had done the will of god and that god was with him why then should he not set out boldly this purity of intention this liberty of conscience is a hidden power of incalculable might which never fails the servant of god and which makes him more invincible than helmets and armed hosts could make him at this time arrived at wittemberg a man who like melancthon was destined to be luther's friend through life and to console him at the moment of his departure it was a priest of thirty-six years of age named bugenhagen who had fled from the severities with which the bishop of carmin and prince bogislas of pomerania persecuted the friends of the gospel of all classes clergy citizens and literati of a senatorial family at volin in pomerania from which he is commonly called pomeranus bugenhagen at twenty years of age began to teach at treptal 
youth flocked to hear him while nobles and learned men vied with each other for his society he was a diligent student of the holy scriptures and prayed to god to instruct him one day towards the end of december fifteen hundred and twenty when he was supping with several friends luther's treatise on the captivity of babylon was put into his hands after turning it over he exclaimed many heretics have infested the church since our saviour died but never was there one more pestilential than the author of this work having taken the book home with him and read it over and over his views entirely changed new truths presented themselves to his mind and returning some days afterwards to his companions he said to them the whole world is fallen into cimmerian darkness this man and none but he sees the truth some priests a deacon even the abbot himself received the pure doctrine of salvation and preaching it with power soon says a historian turned away their hearers from human superstitions to the sole efficacious merit of jesus christ then persecution burst forth several were already immured in dungeons when bugenhagen escaped from his enemies and arrived at wittemberg he suffers for the love of the gospel immediately wrote melancthon to the elector's chaplain where could he fly if not to our asylum to the protection of our prince but none received bugenhagen with so much delight as luther it was arranged between them that immediately after the reformer's departure bugenhagen should begin to expound the psalms thus divine providence brought this powerful mind to aid in supplying the place of him whom wittemberg was going to lose placed a year after at the head of the church of this town bugenhagen presided over it for thirty-six years luther distinguished him by the name of the pastor luther behoved to depart his alarmed friends thought that unless god miraculously interposed he was going to death melancthon who had left his native country had become attached to luther with all the affection of his soul luther said he is to me in place of all my friends i feel him to be greater and more admirable than i can express you know how alcibiades admired his socrates but i admire luther in a higher sense for he is a christian then he added the simple but beautiful expression every time i contemplate him i find him even greater than himself melancthon wished to follow luther in his dangers but their common friends and doubtless the doctor himself were against it must not philip supply the place of his friend and should that friend never return who would direct the cause of the reformation ah would to god said melancthon resigned but grieved would to god i had been allowed to go with him the ardent amsdorf immediately declared that he would accompany the doctor his strong soul felt a pleasure in exposing itself to danger his high bearing enabled him to appear fearless before an assembly of kings the elector had invited to wittemberg as professor of law jerome schurf the son of a physician of st gall a celebrated man of great meekness of temper and a very intimate friend of luther he has not yet summoned up courage said luther to pronounce sentence of death on a single malefactor yet this timid individual volunteered to act as the doctor's counsel on this dangerous journey a young danish student named peter suaven who boarded with melancthon and afterwards distinguished himself by his labours in pomerania and denmark also declared that he would accompany his master the youth in schools were entitled to have their representative beside the champion of truth germany was moved at the thought of the dangers which threatened the representative of her people and found a voice well fitted to express her fears ulrich von hutten shuddered at the thought of the blow about to be struck at his country and on the first of april wrote directly to charles v as follows most excellent emperor 
you are on the point of destroying us and yourself with us what is intended in this affair of luther but just to destroy our liberty and abridge your power there is not throughout the whole breadth of the empire a good man who does not feel the liveliest interest in this business the priests alone are in arms against luther because he is opposed to their excessive power their shameful luxury their depraved lives and has pleaded for the doctrine of christ his country's freedom and purity of manners o emperor dismiss from your presence those orators of rome those bishops and cardinals who would prevent everything like reform did you not observe the sadness of the people on seeing you on your arrival approach the people surrounded by those wearers of red hats by a herd of priests and not a band of valiant warriors do not give up your sovereign majesty to those who would trample it under their feet have pity on us do not in your ruin drag the whole nation along with you place us amid the greatest perils under the swords of the enemy and the cannon's mouth let all nations conspire against us let all armies assail us so that we may be able openly to manifest our valour and not be thus vanquished and enslaved in the dark like women without arms and without a struggle ah our hope was that you would deliver us from the yoke of the romans and overthrow the pontifical tyranny god grant that the future may turn out better than the commencement all germany kneels before you she supplicates you with tears implores your aid your pity your faith and by the holy memory of those germans who when the whole world was subjugated to rome refused to bend their head before that proud city conjures you to save her restore her to herself deliver her from slavery and avenge her of her tyrants so spoke germany to charles v through the instrumentality of the knight the emperor paid no attention to the letter perhaps threw it disdainfully from him to one of his secretaries he was a fleming and not a german personal aggrandizement not the liberty and glory of the empire was the object of all his desires End of book seven chapter six